who don't know me, which is everyone. Uh, I'm Ken Thompson. I, uh, I, I've i been teaching here for about eight years. I started the digital media and design program with Tim Hunter, um, and I specifically focus on the game design concentration. Um, and, you know, part of one of my things I do is I, I'm running the uh, International Game Developers Association Learning, Education, and Games uh, special interest group. And that basically means we're interested in people using games to teach subjects of variety of different things. And uh, this year, we're going to be focusing on a climate change along with one of our other special interest groups. So um, would it be all right if everyone maybe goes around uh, uh, and introduces themselves, maybe Bruce? Uh, Bruce Hyde, I'm with the Yukon Center for Land Use Education and Research. Uh, I teach um, a course, co-teach a course with Juliana, and um, and it's called the Climate Core, which has also started. And one of the reasons I wanted Chet to be in, um, the Climate Core ended up becoming uh, or, or sort of spinning off the Brownfields Core, which also has, has now spun off the um, uh, Stormwater Core, which Chet is involved in. And basically, it's a, a two semester course. First semester is sort of academic, and second semester, um, we send the, the students out into the community to help uh, the communities with real world problems, uh, like doing a vulnerability assessment of a neighborhood or something like that. So that's basically the, the gist of it. The other thing I do is teach uh, um, land use commissioners how not to get sued through the, uh, uh, the, the land use academy. And wouldn't that make a fun game, Bruce? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, that You're would be a fun TV game. Now. <laughs> Juliana, you want to go? Sure. Hi, I'm Juliana Barrett. I'm with Connecticut Sea Grant at UConn um, Clear and UConn Extension. Teach with Bruce, and then I also do coastal habitat management and restoration projects. And I've heard great things about your program from many friends who have who have kids in in your program <laughs> and um um there have been a lot of board games developed for climate change um you know they're coming out at all the, the national climate change meetings adaptation meetings you know you can go to sessions and play these games and everything um and the only one i've seen that's gone online um has to do with flooding um which is which is actually kind of fun we all got to play it and I can send you a link to that um yeah absolutely I think uh finding out more about all those board games would be really great so and um when you talk about um developing online games um are you looking at a particular age group so we're looking at anything that teaches uh it can be to k through 12 uh but also uh, i mean that's who we mostly are thinking about and we are we're coming to realize there aren't too many games about climate change out there already or uh, climate action um and it's kind of why we're focusing on this because we've had we've taught other things with video games for instance assassin's creed there's um a history component to that that many people that um the company is is putting forward but um yeah uh and so that that's a really great uh thing i'm, I'm interested in hearing more and if, if i could just ask one more question before check goes um are you tying into the standards the education standards Yes, well, so I, what our initiative is right now is to start talking and reaching out to um, both educators who are in the field, researchers who are in the field, and making sure that we under everyone and that we highlight what those standards are. Uh, I'm familiar with, for instance, NGSS standards for doing some stuff in uh, with NSF previous to right. this. Uh, but yeah, um, identifying those kind of standards would allow developers who are watching this to maybe understand what they need, where their bar needs to be and how they should be focusing on uh, their their specific needs for climate change specifically, so. Got it, thanks, sorry, go ahead, Chet. I'm jumping ahead. That's okay, I don't have much to say. I'm Chet Arnold, um, I'm uh, also in the Department of Extension and been at UConn a long time and um, I'm the director of CLEAR, the Center for Land Use Education and Research. And we are very much in engagement 
oriented center. So we're shared between two departments, um, Department of Extension and also Department of Natural Resources and the Environment. And we're a little center of about eight to 10 people, depending on how you count. Um, a lot of soft money um, under, you know, underwriting us. Um, and we look at uh, four main areas are water, uh, geospatial technology, land and climate, which Julianne and Bruce basically are the land and climate team, small center, small teams. And um, what am I forgetting? Oh, and STEM education, which we actually count this effort. So as Bruce said, uh, we start out with the climate core, which these two took the lead on, and then it kind of snowballed a little bit into two third similar courses that are kind of a combination of classroom instruction service learning and then kind of extension outreach with the communities and we got a um, an nsf grant to be able to support uh that program and to study it and to see how it's doing and so um and the other thing i wanted to say is you know i, I am not and, and neither is bruce nor juliana but we have some um very um skillful gis and geospatial technology experts at clear um and there certainly are some sophisticated online viewers out there for being able to say, you know, look at how the is going to look in 50 years. This is where the water is going to be. This is what's going to get flooded and stuff. And and there may be some kind of potential there for kind of digital intermingling of what you're trying to do in some of these kind of sophisticated modeling tools. I don't know. Oh, awesome. great. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, so when you're... Uh, sorry, uh, I had a little feedback. So when uh, when you're working in with your class, you're creating an RPG, is what I understand it. You're, you're working through them in a role playing scenario where they're working to to help a community. Uh, can you maybe tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, actually, I, um, what we've done is created this scenario. Uh, it's all hypothetical, where there's. Um, 16 houses and a business and a town beach on a point where the road that is going to the, the, the point is constantly getting washed out and eroded. And so several of the people that are living on what we call the point um, petition the town council to buy them out uh, through basically managed retreat using eminent domain if necessary and um, uh, there's a federal grant and a state grant involved to help pay for it. And so we broke the students up into people that some of the people live on the island or on the point, uh, the bar owner called the retreat. Um, and uh, some of them are like outside influences, uh, like Lada Carbon, who is the um, uh, regional person for the uh, Organization of Climate Change Deniers and outside climate scientists and things like that. And we give each person a role. Each of the students gets a role to play. The first paper they have to submit is what we call a character development paper. And that's so that they helps them get into the role of their character because we need to take some you know, these, of these rabid environmentalists and put them into a, uh, a political role like Jim Jordan. Um, and so some of them have really fun making the transition and, and really go wild. Some of them don't. So basically then the second paper is for them to write a position paper um, uh, on what they're going to do uh, and, and they testify. They actually have a, like a mock town council meeting and the people testify. We give them their position because the first year we did it when we didn't tell them what their position was. They all were in favor of, um, you know, the environmental side of things. Yeah, you know, what a surprise. So we give them a position and some of them have to be against it. Uh, we also have, uh, this year we had three people from, or four people from newspapers, Fox News being one of them, uh, CNN being one. Um, there was one from the International News Service and another one from uh, a, a newspaper that promoted conspiracy theories. Mm -hmm. um, and so we hold the public hearing. Town council's got to vote, defend the position, and that's it. And the newspaper folks have to write a uh, either an op-ed piece or a newspaper article on the proceedings. 
Yeah, that, that is really fun. I was really glad to hear that you uh, had been working uh, kind of with your class to do this. And from everything I was reading over, you've got, you know, uh, you've got these demographics, which is like a world map, you know, you've got statistics about the areas, um, you've got the cost of property and the types of property. Um, you've got these NPCs, non-player characters who are acting as back, uh, where you're asking them to write backstory, which, you know, a traditional Dungeons and Dragons -y kind of thing to do is got to write your backstory for your character. Um, and you even have this intriguing sub narrative about these mysterious rogue EPA agents. Uh, do they have a secret base? Is it on the moon? Well, that's, that's actually, the, that's actually the managed retreat or the cost of sea level rise exercise. That's different than the role playing exercise, but ah, yes, okay. yeah, um, uh, I'm jumping ahead. <laughs> no, that's okay. Um, yeah, we, we wanted to do that just to kind of put what, what we tried to do was to put them in the role of a consultant in that, in this one. And if you were a consultant, what you would do so that when they go out into the real world, they have some sense of how this stuff actually works. And uh, what they do is not too far uh, from what consulting folks do on the, the managed retreat. We originally started that out with the cost of sea level rise and used uh, Miami Beach and Charleston, South Carolina and North Beach in Florida, uh, just north of Miami and had them work with those communities. But this year we decided to add an element of social justice into it. Um, so there really wasn't much we could do with Miami Beach from a social justice standpoint. So we just made up a community. Um, and I used uh, actual census tract data for the individual neighborhoods so that, you know, I, I basically figured the easiest way to do it and plus the most, I hate to say this politically correct way to do it, would be to have statistics that were true of an actual neighborhood. So that somebody couldn't come in later on and say, well, that's not the way neighborhoods really are, or, you know, give me some kind of crap. And I could just pull that out and say, well, yeah, they are like this. And here's, here's why. Yeah. And so can do you, you excuse me for just a second? I got a dog that's yeah. driving me out of the my mom. <laughs> no she problem. Drops her ball underneath the table. <laughs> uh, and, you know, maybe then, uh, 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 Juliana, maybe you'd like to pick this up. Uh, what do you, think about why to make this class interactive why and I think Bruce kind of hinted at it but why why not make this a quiz oh uh, because we really um the first time we taught the course we had um a midterm and a, a final that were exams right and and we don't want to just do multiple choice where you regurgitate you know here's what the expect expectations are or whatever you know the facts are because we we really want them to be able to think outside the box and and to use some creativity and to really apply what they are what they've learned to a solution because that's what it's all about yeah that thinking is is our main goal is to make them think because that you know that traditional model of a bunch of lectures a midterm a bunch of lectures and a final. I went through that and I don't remember half of what, well, there's a reason why I don't remember half of what I learned, but um, Chet knows what I'm talking about. He went to school at the same time I did. Um, but it just didn't seem like we're, that a lot of the courses at UConn are making the kids think, the kids, the students. Um, and so that was that was our goal. Awesome. Yeah. And so have you any specific outcomes or student stories? Uh, of course, names, names excluded, of course, but uh, anything interesting come about that or any aha moments for any of your students so far? Well, yeah, I mean, we, the, the student evaluation of teaching reviews that we get are they're, they're the reason I think why, at least I'm still teaching and I think why Juliana wants to continue to do it. You know, I should have retired four years ago, but I love doing this and the reaction that we get from the kids is something that makes it worthwhile doing. Get out of here. 
they talk. I think I think Chris alluded to this. The students talk about, oh, we had to go down all these rabbit holes. We figured out those things weren't going to work, you know, which is so applicable to a game, right? Um, mm -hmm. So they have to try different things, see what works, see what doesn't work, and then they can move forward toward the solution. Well, and you guys have gotten a lot of great feedback from students, you know, when Bruce reached out to them informally last year, and we're going to be doing some of this formally as part of the NSF project. Um, but a number of students who said either A, it helped them decide what they really wanted to do, and focus on while they were at UConn and, and or B, it helped them to get a job once they were out. Um, the other thing, that, this is probably not relevant um, to the gaming part, but we, maybe it is, um, we were already embarking on an evaluation, for, um, if you want to call it that, with the communities and what the communities think of the projects that the students go on to do during the second semester. And that that seems like we're um, we're doing pretty well on that on that score too. I was surprised how positive that feedback was actually when Todd told us about it. So, yeah, that's really great. And, and yeah. you know, there there could be applications, of course, where you know games can be used to help in informal ways or in in uh, ways that are more structured. Um, there has been a, another game called Fold It. It's a protein folding game that allowed researchers in Seattle to uh, kind of outsource their computational issue. Like they had a lot of things they had to compute. I don't know how protein folding works, but I understand that it's complicated and computers are bad at doing it. So they designed a little game that uh, allowed them to distribute the work for this. And it's just a puzzle where you kind of, you know, figured it out and then users would submit their puzzle solutions to the researchers and it was a nice little feedback loop. So it's really great to hear that there's uh, uh, a uh, component already in your work about connecting with the people affected with what, what's going on. So that's really awesome. So, um, but, it, you know. Mm -hmm. I was just gonna say, I. I think, and Bruce, you should probably mute yourself when you were having that usual Bruce Hyde feedback problem when um, that, and we do a role playing game in ours, which patterned totally after what Julianne and Bruce developed. And I think we've had the same experience, even though we've only done it uh, once and we're going to about to do it again, is that we did it initially, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, guys. Um, so that they would get a feel for the way decisions were really made at the local level. Um, but what we found out was in addition to that, the actual perhaps, and the biggest benefit was for them to know what it's like to kind of be in someone else's shoes, which is what Bruce was talking about. And it just strikes me that that's a kind of typical thing that gamers do. I, I don't know that much about the gaming world, but obviously you, you take on an avatar or whatever and and you develop that whole thing, but um, this is kind of more like a real world avatar where you take the role of the climate denier and and maybe not necessarily get to, around to seeing their point of view, but you can understand why it's such a difficult process to reach consensus. And you're not just coming out of school with a textbook view of the world, you know, of, of, of right and wrong. So anyway, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Again. No, not at all. That was really great. Uh, it was better detail as well. Um, I, I was going to ask if anyone, so for educators who are like yourselves looking to implement, um, you know, game based content for their classroom to teach uh, um, these types of topics, do you have, uh, it's probably so K through 12 probably, but also in the college field as well. Um, uh, do you have any recommendations for how educators, like, is, is there anything you looked at? Like, do you just decide this? Did you, uh, did one of your kids just start making you do Dungeons and Dragons and you're like, aha, uh, -huh. uh, like how, how, what was the story for why you started this? If, if it sounds like you're not very many game players, which I, excuse me if I'm wrong. Bruce, you're muted. Yeah. Well, okay. Bruce but, really is a serious gamer. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say, um, I'm pretty much stuck on Wii Tennis. So okay. that's that's the end of, of where I have gone as far as gaming is concerned. Um, where this all came from, uh, well, the role-playing exercise basically came from 
something I did when I lived in Vermont and I was teaching at SUNY Plattsburgh. I taught a, cor a course there in Introduction to Planning. And um, I cannot take credit for this. The guy who was leaving uh, left me with this idea of a paper mill in Plattsburgh, New York, was polluting people's wells uh, and everybody got assigned, you know, different roles. And we had a uh, public hearing uh, about the whole thing. So that's, I, when I started thinking about teaching this class, I thought, this class really lends itself to doing something like that. Um, as far as the cost of managed retreat or the cost of sea level rise, whatever you want to call it, um, I've just kept on thinking, and Julianne and I have had this discussion about how uh, the economics are what's really going to drive people to change their way they're looking at climate. And it's all going to come down to money. So if we started the students with the cost of what it's going to cost and had an exercise that showed them, you know, by the time you get done, if you move people from half of Miami Beach, by the time you get done, the, the, the bill is $2 billion. And you're going to start thinking about that in the future when all this stuff, I know I'm being recorded, so I'm going to choose my words carefully, um, <laughs> uh, you know, comes to, to actually happen. And there are places where people have to abandon them. Um, it's going to cost. And I don't mind being recorded on this because I said it a million times. My generation, the baby boomers, have totally screwed your generation. Uh, we're leaving you with a huge problem with respect to climate and a huge debt, so there's no money to fix it. Yeah, I, it's a very serious issue for sure. And uh, it's certainly one of the reasons why I thought it was really important to work on this as well. Um, you know, that and uh, um, I, you know, my heating bill keeps getting really weird too around here. <laughs> you know, that, that's, it's, there's also a personal component of just being able to uh, make sure that my basement doesn't get flooded as well. But, um, but absolutely, it's, it's really important um, to kind of bring the uh, clarity. And that's, I think, one of the things that is powerful about game development in general is uh, uh, we have that ability to show the big picture and this may be, I think you kind of teed us off into my next question, um, or maybe not, maybe we'll go a different direction, but how about this? What if, what, let's, what if uh, we have a little bit of a brainstorm time? If you could make a game about some aspect of, of climate, uh, of the climate, what problem would we, would we focus on and what would you, what game would you make about it? And Chet, I remember you mentioned something earlier too. So, uh, you know, any ideas are welcome. Knowing that you're all perfect at, uh, game developers already, but like, what you know, what is it that you see uh, the connections are? Because because you've been thinking about it, you've been doing some role playing. Um, but uh, uh, what kind of things do you feel like you are trying to solve that are having that you're having challenges with, and maybe uh, we can apply some of the uh, games to that? I'm going to jump in here right for a second and suggest that Juliana talk about. I mean, one of the things. The role playing exercise relies on is, you know, 15, 20 people. Um, and I'm not sure that that's the kind of, I, I don't know anything about gaming, but Juliana uh, came up with a project for this semester um, where it was one person had to do something. And I think that could kind of be cool and lead to something. So I'll let her describe it. So, so, um, this is based on something I saw that a university of did he he created plaques you know the historic plaques that you see um you know the war of whatever happened here so so what students had to do um is create a plaque for something that happened related to climate change in 2050 and it could be sea level rise it could have been a major flood event um oh what else did they choose a uh, major storm event there was hurricane bruce um you know, so it was some catastrophic event tied to climate change and they had to say what the impacts were. So what happened there and and what was the solution? So, you know, that that's how and, and very similar to the managed retreat exercise. It's 
um, trying to tie it all together. So, so managed retreat is based on sea level rise, right? Um, the midterm, this, this exercise with the plaque um, can be anything that's climate, a climate impact, right? We stay, we stay away in our course from mitigation and reducing CO2 emissions. Um, just because there's only so much you can do in a semester, right? But that's not to say that's not an important component and man, you get into carbon exchanges and, you know, you could just take off, you know, in terms of a game. Um, but increased precipitation events, you know, causing flooding, um, uh, the whole human health, we talk about, um, vector borne diseases, ticks, right? Spreading um, changes in, in um, growth patterns, vegetation, you know, but I think we really focus the most on sea level rise, um, increased precipitation, which pulls in the stormwater core, you know, looking at increased stormwater and flooding. Um, and what else, Bruce? I, you know, it's really those two, those are the two biggest things. And, and to a certain extent, um, major storm events and how climate change is impacting those. I was actually thinking of, of something that is based on, um, and this, you were probably weren't even born when we were doing this, the original Oregon Trail. Yes. Um, yeah. You know, where you, you would give somebody a, a certain amount of money and they would have to make choices about what kinds of things they would want to do relative to adaptation or relative to carbon reduction. And then the choices, each choice that they made would lead to something else. Uh, by the way, it was also Hurricane Juliana, if you remember correctly. Um, and, uh, you know, a hurricane could come in, then they'd have to make some decisions about what they want to do, uh, whether they want to do some adaptation or they want to do more carbon reduction. You know, just stuff like that, and and are they going to move people? How much is that going to cost? So, taking some something of what's actually happening in the real world, of storms, sea level rise, you know, storm surge, all that other stuff, and having them have to make choices about what they're going to do as they move forward, and if they make the wrong choices, at least to some sort of you know, apocalyptic world that blows up or, or freezes or, you know, does something. And if they make the right choices, then we're better off than we would have been if we made the wrong choices. Yeah, yeah. it occurs to me that, uh, that perhaps, you know, if games are very good at modeling systems. And of course, there are system models um, that are realistic ones, but uh, showing cause and effect by tinkering with a system that might be in balance to show how little changes can uh, react uh, down the line, but making sure that those connections are really clear. Um, you know, sea level rise uh, means we have to move population, and you know, maybe that's what you're dealing with. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, that'd be cool. Uh, any other any other thoughts that or things um, uh, specifically? And, and this, you know, I, I think we'll get different answers for different groups of people. But is there anything out in the media that? You said you thought, huh, that might have potential or um, in terms of games um, that you may have seen and you were like, oh, that's in I, I don't know. Um, and uh, is there any. Um, yeah, is there anything like that that you might have seen seen or come across. Not me. Okay, yeah, that's good. I, I only ask because I do know that there are some games out there that do do a little bit of, uh, um, you know, like pollution and some climate change, for instance, civilization six, um, I believe has uh, some aspects of that, like, as you're building your civilization, if you decide to build a lot of diesel equipment, then you get like clouds and uh, bad, uh, bad climate effects. Um, I don't believe that it's a system in the way that we're talking about, but just if you'd ever heard of anything. Uh, it could have, um, so one of the games that my kids used to play, and I don't remember the name, but it's, I think it's in that civilization line. One of the things that the students do with the managed retreat is they have to move people and create that new place. 
And what's really cool is that they're all powerful. They can move them anywhere. They have to justify it, right? So, and then they create a community and, and they add in stormwater and, you know, um, um, having um, a really functional um, downtown area, like stores right now, um, where everything is, is walkable and all those things. And so um, we had one group of students who, who decided to take over a university, I think it was in Durham, and just move all the students and move people into the university. And somebody else created a cargo, you know, the big shipping container community. And mm -hmm. so, boy, you know, that really, to me, lends itself to build your new community and how are things gonna be equitable and all that kind of stuff. Didn't one of your groups move them all to South South Dakota or something? They said, oh. yeah, the, the land's cheap out there. It won't cost hardly anything. We'll just move all these people from Miami Beach to the middle of South Dakota. <laughs> well, what they were saying was that they thought, you know, in 75 years or 100 years, the climate in South Dakota would be similar to the climate in like Northern Texas. So they were just getting out True. ahead of the game. Yeah, retire. <laughs> I was going to say, I, I do think that there's an element there of being all powerful that's attractive because this is a pretty huge, scary problem, right? And you don't want the game to be so realistic that they're not going to be able to have an impact, you know? And so it seems to me that some of these elements where you could, you could do something that's slightly fantastic, but that would have great impact one way or the other, I suppose, is, is kind of is kind of attractive to me anyway. Um, otherwise, you've got a depressing game. I mean, so <laughs> you don't want that. Oh. And my kids played <laughs> Amazon Trail, Bruce, which is the uh, slightly younger sister to Oregon Trail, where they where you had to go into the Amazon to find yeah instead of instead of uh, do the Oregon Trail. That was a great game. <laughs> you know, and and there are elements of those games where you go in and you find things that enable you to do more things. I mean, that's a classic game. I'm sure it's just a classic gaming thing, right? So, so if players of this game could, of a climate game could find prizes or something or knowledge or something that they're seeking that gives them the power to do something a little more than human, superhuman, you know, or, uh, additional power. I just think that would be an attractive element to it. I mean, I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm just rambling, but. Oh, that's good. That's it's, it's important to understand where, you know, and one of the things that I found when I came to Yukon is that collaborating with my other colleagues, understanding the things that are going on in, in your all head, in your head, um, really allows developers, uh, um, who will, I hope consume some of this, um and help developers kind of see what it is that that is special about our medium from your eyes because uh, that can really you know change things uh, I, i'm working with a historian and i showed to her that we can use the digital archives inside uh, we can just summon them as a web page and we can you know organize them and do whatever we want from the yukon digital archives inside of a game uh, instead of software. And so, and she was very, very excited about that when I first showed her and I was like, oh yeah, that's just the thing I can do. So, uh, you know, it's good to, good to see what everyone else gets excited or think is thinking about when from an outside perspective. Um, is there anything else that you all would like to share uh, in terms of, you know, this is this audience is mostly going to be hopefully uh, game developers, people uh, and or academics who are interested in interactive teaching. Um, so is there anything else that you'd like to, to share with either group? I, I, I'm not sure how relevant this is, but one of the other things that we did was we had them read the book Cloudy with a Chance in Meatballs. Um, and it sounds, you know, th these are juniors and seniors, mostly in, in college that are reading a kid's book. And what we did was to have them relate what went on in that book to what's happening in the real world today. Uh, and it, it, it was a lot of fun. I think they had a good time doing it. It was a good exercise. That would be a fun one to play with, to, to do a, a game based on that. <laughs> that. They really did enjoy it. That was a really great idea of Bruce's. Um, just, I, I guess I would say it's really important 
to keep it simple um in 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 terms of there's so many climate change impacts everything right and so it's so it it would be so easy to get way too complicated way too fast and so i think the most effective and and this is what we keep doing in our course right is is almost to keep paring things down and really focus on like sea level rise and impacts or you know, flooding and impacts um, because, you know, everywhere you look, it's, you know, asthma or, you know, anything, mold, you name it, you could just go on forever. Um, and so I think really focusing in on one or two impacts would be a, a key way to go. You know, just if I, if my gut reaction, Juliana, is, which is take it for what it's worth is, I, th I totally agree with you. It's easy to get out of control. I think the whole um, retreat from the coast, like the managed retreat thing, is a is kind of an interesting way to focus, and it and it plays into what Bruce's was saying with the Oregon Trail analogy, which is you're given certain resources, you're given certain sources of information, you know, about population, about the cost of land, about the cost of tearing buildings down about how fast sea levels rising whatever and then you and then you're trying to come up with a solution and it, and it's plenty complex because it will give you an idea of the interplay that's what your students get out of that exercise is whoa if we do this then these 10 things are going to happen or the lecture that Bruce gives when he talks about um the what the hurricane that hit uh Houston why am i forgetting Hugo Harvey Harvey I knew it was an h Houston Harvey or Hugo and um, and gets them to think like two or three steps into what not just that the guy's house got flooded but what happens after that and the fact that he can't pay the mortgage and the fact that the bank what happens at the bank and that kind of thing and and I just think that the retreat thing would be an interesting thing to turn into a game that's just my personal opinion awesome well and, I, I sorry could I just add one more thing um um the us has has sort of one opinion right but the work that's going on internationally like in in the netherlands in denmark it's it's um in some ways so much more advanced than what we're doing you know people are willing to sell people are willing to retreat from the coast maybe not willingly but for the greater good you know there's that whole idea australia is way ahead on coastal applications so there's also an international component to it. Awesome. Well, I really appreciate all of your time and feedback on this. It's part of a series that we're hopefully going to continue and do, you know, like one a month or so um, uh, up until maybe uh, uh, June and hopefully have a conference proceeding based off that, just trying to do a survey of what's out there. Um, so again, really appreciate your work. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah sure. great talking with you. Yeah, and if you could press Bruce, if you could hit the stop button um, before we leave, just in case that way it'll do its thing. Um, we can get that and then.